Okay, good morning. Let's get started. Uh, I'd like to continue today again with Faraday's law and transformer EMF. Remember what transformer EMF means. Uh, generally, Faraday's law tells us that there is an electromotive force whenever there is uh, changing flux through a circuit. Transformer EMF means that the circuit is fixed just like this uh, coil, this inductor, right? And then the magnetic flux through it changes. So uh, you can hopefully see this voltmeter over there on the slide. Uh, and uh, I can, with a magnet, change the magnetic flux through the, um, through the circuit. And you see that the voltmeter picks up a voltage. So this is what we call transformer EMF. It's very easy to demonstrate. A, at the same time, a startling effect in the sense that I'm inducing a current as if it was a virtual source. So you see here I have just a short circuit, a bunch of wires that have been turned around a, a, a core. And then just by, chain, by uh, putting a magnet in and out, I'm creating a current that you can see in the voltmeter. And you can imagine that this motion is created by a wheel that is turning uh, because of wind uh, power. And hence, you have a very simple way of converting me mechanical energy, either from wind or water, to electrical energy. And of course, how fast I uh, put the magnet in and out affects uh, the uh, voltage, the magnitude of the current. So this is uh, the transformer EMF. And one of the things that I wanted to bring to your uh, attention about uh, Faraday's law, and in this case of uh, transformer EMF, let me just uh, go back to the board is that if you look at Faraday's law and compare it to Ampere's law, so Ampere's law says this. That there will be circulating magnetic field around a current. Faraday's law says that um, there will be circulating electric field, not magnetic field, electric field around a circuit that intercepts time-varying magnetic flux. So if you look at these two laws, you directly extract the conclusion that just like currents generate magnetic fields, flux generates electric field in exactly the same way. So by inspection of the two laws, by inspection and comparison of the two laws, one can conclude that uh, magnetic flux or changing magnetic flux, I should be more precise, generates electromotive force or electric field in the same way that current generates magnetic field. So whatever we have seen in Ampere's law, we can now leverage it to apply Faraday's law and understand how magnetic fields are, uh, electric fields are created from um, changing magnetic flux. So just changing magnetic field generates electric field um, just like current generates magnetic field. In magnetostatics. And again, it is very important to uh, see the course concepts uh, as a union of concepts and uh, try to understand one part using the other part, since there are all these very important connections. 
So what, do we, uh, what can we conclude here? For example, we have seen in Amper's law this case of the current density supported in a cylinder. If you go back to your uh, notes, you will see this uh, case where we had the uh, current J naught Z hat, constant current, de uh, current density, volume current density in a cylinder of radius A. And we wanted to find the magnetic field that is being generated by this current. And we had uh, argued at the time that this magnetic field will be circulating around the current. We had applied Ampere's law in a circular contour And that gave us the magnetic field circulating around the current. And you remember when the circle, when this disk is all inside the cylinder, it intercepts current that is J naught pi R squared. That's the total current enclosed within this cylinder, within this uh, disk, sorry. Now, when this disk is outside the cylinder, so when this is uh, when R is less than A, when R is greater than A, it intercepts the entire current, which is J naught pi A squared. And that is how we found the magnetic field that was circulating around the current. Okay? So, and of course, if this is a, a, a thin wire like this with current I, we know that the magnetic field will be circulating around. This is the fundamental system in magnetism of a current uh, that creates a magnetic field. That magnetic field is I by 2 pi R and it's circulating around the, uh, the wire. Okay? So that is what we know from magnetostatics. So now, uh, this is, here is another problem or the uh, corresponding problem in Faraday's law. Find the electric field created by a time varying magnetic field B equals to B of T in the Z direction. So I'm setting up a very similar problem whereby I have, just like in magnetostatics, I had a uniform current density. Now I have a uniform magnetic flux that is time varying because I know from the inspection of these two laws that this time varying magnetic flux will generate electric fields in the same way that, uh, that currents will generate magnetic fields. So this is the example. We have here the z-axis and there is magnetic field that is coming up this way and it is uniform. And changes with, with time. Okay. So what electric field do I expect there and how do I find it? Any, uh, any ideas? So any ideas for... Uh, so how can I uh, use this information to find the, the magnetic field? The electric field, sorry, that is generated now this time. And by the way, we saw such a magnetic field yesterday in the case of the transformer. Because in the transformer, you have exactly this situation. Inside the core, you have this magnetic flux 
that uniformly flows and in fact inside the material that has some conductivity and it can create uh, not just electric fields but also currents. So anyway, to solve this riddle and solve this uh, electric field, we simply have to apply now the Faraday law on a circular contour like this. So I will apply Faraday's law on a circular contour of radius r. Uh, in this case, the field is everywhere, both inside and outside, and therefore I don't need to make a distinction whether r is greater or less than uh, a, a radius of a cylinder. So I apply Faraday law. circular contour of radius r. Okay. And I expect that the electric field will have exactly the same form as the magnetic field. That is, will have only a phi component and will depend only on the distance from the z-axis. So I'm making use of this information that I had before from magnetic fields from a current. I know that the magnetic field would be circulating. It depends only on the distance from the axis. And I'm using exactly now the same form for the electric field. So the corresponding ds will be pointing upwards. So this is the ds uh, is equal to... Uh, r d phi dr in the z direction. So Faraday's law says that the integral of the electric field around the, this circle, which is equal to e phi times 2 pi r, the perimeter of the circle, is equal to the negative rate of flux intercepted by the area defined by the circle. So you see the magnetic field is uniform through this disk. Uh, its magnitude is depending only on time, but not on radius or angle. So therefore, the total flux that is being intercepted here, which is time varying, is B of t times pi r squared. So the magnetic field is constant through the circle. The circle has area pi r squared. So the total flux is b times pi r squared. And here the magnetic field actually flows in the direction that is uh, consistent with the direction of ds. So therefore, the flux through this area is positive. So I put it uh, here in uh, this expression as positive b pi r squared. So basically, here you have the uh, b of t z hat multiplying the z hat unit vector ds. So z dot z is equal to 1, not minus 1. We have the flux consistent with the direction that by Faraday's law is defined as the positive direction of flux. As a result, the law tells me that E phi times 2 pi r will be equal to minus d over dt pi r squared. So therefore, the electric field pi and pi cancels out, r and r partially cancel out the electric field will be r minus r over 2 d over dt b of t. Okay. So this is the electric field. There will be a, a circulating electric field. So just to put numbers to this as an example,
let's consider a B that is uh, 10 to minus 4 around the magnetic flux density of the Earth, uh, Earth's magnetic field, cosine 2 pi times 10 to the 6 t in the z direction. Okay, so let's uh, say that we have a 1 megahertz magnetic field with uh, 10 to minus 4 tesla amplitude. Then dB over dt is equal to 10 to minus 4 times 2 pi times 10 to the 6th minus sine of 2 pi 10 to the 16th. So we have a sinusoidal flux with a minus sign. Uh, so 10 to minus 4, 10 to the 6th is 100. So we have 200 pi, in fact, minus 200 pi sine of 2 pi times 10 to the 6th. Okay, so this is the... Um, Flux and the electric field then is minus this, so we have two minus signs and as a result the electric field is plus 100 pi r sine 2 pi 10 to the 6th. Okay, so this electric field is growing with radius. And of course, uh, inside a core like this, it would grow with radius. Then if you go outside the core, it doesn't grow anymore, just like the magnetic field in a current density. Okay? So we see then this uh, electric field lines that are forming here. So if uh, I have this uh, kind of electric field inside the core, that is a case when uh, this setup can actually materialize. You have a time varying magnetic flux, phi of t, and then that means that you have circulating electric field inside here. These uh, cores are made out of metals and therefore there will be currents inside, circulating currents. So there will be a volume current density which will develop in the presence of some conductivity and from Ohm's law that we saw in electrostatics, that current density will be conductivity times the electric field, sigma times E. So there will be a electric current that will be also circulating around. So not only I have electric field, but also I have current that is developing inside the core. And this is the primary uh, source of losses in magnetic cores because this current will dissipate ohmic power. And that is why also if you play with transformers uh, in a lab, you will see that they are heating up precisely because we have the development of these circulating currents. We have a particular name for these currents. They are called eddy currents. And eddy means uh, precisely that they are circulating. is eddy currents that have many, many applications. Uh, and um, we'll see uh, one right now. But uh, before I proceed, any questions on the example? So the principle here that I try to demonstrate is fairly simple. You have a time-varying magnetic flux that generates electric field. The question is, how do you figure out where is that electric field? And one can leverage whatever we've seen in magnetostatics, the correspondence between 
Ampere's law and Faraday law to figure out what is the form of the electric field. Once you know the form of the electric field, then that facilitates the application of the law because then you know um, where the electric field points and, uh, and then you can set up a contour that makes this integral easy to calculate and also makes it proportional to the electric field that is your unknown. Uh, remember that Ampere's law, just like Gauss's law, they are universally true, but they are only useful for calculating electrical magnetic fields when you know by symmetry arguments where the electric field lines or the magnetic field lines are. Otherwise, they are true, but they are not useful to find fields. So in this case, we were able to uh, calculate those eddy currents, uh, which are very important. It's a very important phenomenon in magnetic cores, precisely because those eddy currents dissipate power. So let me make a note here. Eddy currents dissipate ohmic power. This is a form of loss in transformers. And that's why many times we practically put together those cores with laminated rods. So we try, that is, to open circuit those eddy currents by wrapping. So instead of making a tran uh, uh, the um, cross-section of the core uniformly covered with some material, mu sub bar, we actually put it together by segments like this. Uh, where those uh, lines that I have here are basically insulations. So uh, the eddy currents in the first case are developing like this and they are dissipating power uniformly throughout the cross-section, whereas here we're trying to open circuit them. So we're putting in those insulating materials separating those subsections of the cross section of the core in order to reduce those eddy currents because now you cannot, the currents cannot flow uniformly around the core due to the presence of this insulation. So here you have conductivity that is very small. Therefore, the current cannot uniformly flow and dissipate power throughout the core. It just gets open circuited there. Uh, let me uh, uh, say one more thing about the problem, or I go back to the example that we uh, just uh, solved. And um, let me point out here that the magnetic field that we assumed is a cosinusoidal magnetic field. So I will check now that I have currents, and the currents, as you remember, produce their own magnetic field. I'll check what we called Lenz's law uh, in uh, two lectures ago. And probably I will use this part of the board. So let's plot the magnetic field. The magnetic field is cosinusoidal. Therefore, it will look like this. So it will start 
positive, and when it is positive, it will be pointing along the z-axis, right? If the cosine is positive, the direction of the magnetic field is in the z-axis. When it is negative, it will be pointing in the minus z-axis because we have the uh, z-unit vector here. If this is negative, then the actual direction of the magnetic field is in the minus z-axis. So let me use this axis to denote the minus z-axis. And then it becomes again positive and we have this. The electric current that flows in the phi direction is actually in the electric field. Same thing, let me plot the electric field E phi. Is sinusoidal, so it's sine to pi, etc. So it follows actually this direction over one single period. Okay, so the electric field here points in the phi direction, which is, let's say, along the z-axis. If this is a z-axis, the phi direction is actually this one. Okay, and then it will change sign. So on this side, it will be pointing in the minus phi direction. So it will be pointing like this. Okay. So now if these electric fields produce currents in the presence of conductivity, these currents will produce their own magnetic field. So the magnetic field now, the secondary magnetic field produced by these currents will be when the currents flow in the phi direction, the magnetic field will be pointing outwards. And when the currents point in the minus phi direction, this magnetic field will be pointing inwards. Okay. So again, the uh, orange arrows denote the external magnetic field and the yellow arrows, the secondary magnetic field that is produced by those induced currents. So the induced currents produce these secondary magnetic fields. And here is again what Lenz's law says. Very important. The induced currents will try to oppose the change in the magnetic flux. So you see on this side, the magnetic flux tends to decrease. It points in the z direction and tends to decrease. So the trend in the magnetic flux is the decrease of the flux in the z direction. So the induced magnetic field will oppose that. What does it mean to oppose it? It will try to compensate for the external magnetic field so that this reduction does not happen. Then in this second quarter, the magnetic flux has now changed polarity. It goes into the board and starts becoming more and more and more negative. That is, increases in this direction. Then the induced magnetic field will oppose that. So will stay in the direction out of the board in order to reduce this now increasing magnetic flux in the other direction. Third quarter. The magnetic flux now in this direction into the board starts decreasing, going to zero. So now the induced magnetic flux changes direction and goes into the board to oppose that change. So it opposes the change. It doesn't oppose the magnetic field. You see here those fields are co-directional. Here they are contra-directional. So it's not right to say that the induced currents oppose the external field. No, they oppose the change in the external field and the external uh, flux. So that is Lenz's law. Here, indeed, our calculations were right, and that's why the law came out correct. And we use this effect to make magnetic breaks. That is what I have here, a metallic plate, a magnet. It is a strong magnet. And you will see I'm trying to move the plate. And it will be stopped by the magnet. You see, this is the concept of magnetic brakes, 
what has happened here What has happened here is that my magnet produces a strong magnetic field. So I have the plate. It is a metallic plate, so there is conductivity. And therefore, the electric field on the plate will create a current on the plate. So the plate is swinging and enters the magnetic field that is created by this magnet. So as it enters the magnetic field, on the plate we have an increase in the magnetic flux. So therefore, there will be induced electric field and electric currents that will try to oppose this external magnetic flux. So I'm expecting currents that will be flowing this way. So this is the direction of the eddy currents now. So the electric field will be flowing this way. Hence, there will be currents in this way. And now we know that the current in this direction will, in this direction primarily, will actually experience a force from the magnetic field that is current, magnetic field, and then the force goes backwards. So it's a breaking force. So now the magnet will actually apply a force that will go against the motion, against the motion. So when now my plate comes out of the magnetic field and goes here, as it swings, guess what? Lenz's law says that the induced currents will oppose this change in the magnetic flux. How will they oppose the change? They will tend to produce a magnetic flux that reinforces the now decaying flux. So now the eddy currents will be going this way. So now the eddy currents go this way. And then a magnetic field that comes out of the board will actually, on these currents, uh, let me uh, make sure that I have the correct polarity. That's right. So on these currents now that go downwards, the magnetic field comes out, and therefore, again, the force will be breaking, will be opposing this motion. So you see, both when I come in to the magnetic field and when I come out of the magnetic field, the eddy currents, the way that they are induced by Lenz's law, they are producing a force that opposes the motion. And that's why we see this kind of breaking happening here on the plate. Uh, I should add about eddy currents because it's uh, one of the things that come up uh, most <laughs> frequently, or very frequently at least, with uh, alumni who come back and ask me about uh, things they've heard in the course. Uh, it's uh, an area that uh, these eddy currents, just because of the losses, because of the technology applications, uh, are uh, very much encountered. I should say also that they are also employed in a range of technologies that is called non-destructive evaluation. So, Non-destructive evaluation, or NDE,
It's a range of technologies that is based on eddy currents and is encountered from civil engineering to uh, bioengineering. And the concept always is the following. Let's say that you have a road or a wall and you want to figure out whether there is a crack somewhere here. Okay. So you want to find that out without digging the road, obviously, because that would defeat the purpose. Um, see it from outside. So non-destructive evaluation technologies use a primary coil to introduce a time-varying magnetic field. So there will be here, because of the coil, a time-varying magnetic field. Time-varying. So that goes into things like uh, concrete or rock, uh, that where there is some conductivity. And because of the conductivity, we have the introduction of eddy currents. And those eddy currents will create a secondary magnetic flux. So then you come in with a secondary coil this flux can be measured by Faraday's law again it's time varying flux therefore it introduces an electromotive force and hence you can actually measure it and based on the signature of the signal that you are receiving you can detect whether it is a fault or not the reason being that cracks like this will generate highly non-uniform magnetic fluxes. So when you scan the area above the wall or above the road or above the brain as well, when it is used in biomedical applications, when something wrong goes on underneath, then those signals that the secondary coil will pick up from the eddy currents will be non-uniform. And indeed, because the eddy currents will just follow the crack and will be themselves non-uniform and hence the flux they will generate will be non-uniform. Whereas when you have uniform concrete, then the eddy currents will also be uniform and you will be measuring a very smooth signal above. So this is uh, a concept where these uh, eddy currents come in uh, quite handy. So I'll stop here. Any uh, questions up to this point? Yes. So uh, you remember that the force on a moving charge is QV cross B, okay? V cross B. So now if this V comes from a current, you replace it with the direction of the current, okay? So here the direction of the current is primarily downward. The magnetic field comes out and then the force goes back. Yes, goes downwards primarily because it goes in this direction. So this side will have a downward current. Yeah, I know it's a little bit uh, challenging. So uh, in addition now to transformer EMF, we also have motional EMF. And what motional EMF now means is that your magnet can be constant, just like uh, this magnet down here. But the circuit may change. And let me just go back to the projector for, for a little bit. Okay, unfortunately we don't have an overhead projector here, but Okay, so now I have here a moving circuit, a magnet that is a constant magnet. I hope you can see the needle. 
And this is now a coil. I move it in and out of the magnet, and you see again I'm inducing current. Is it visible? You see it? Ah, OK, sorry. I just need to click send to the projector. All right, so now I hope you can see it. OK. OK, so now it uh, popped out. But uh, you got the uh, idea. So in this case, I have what is called motional EMF. My uh, magnet is constant, but now it's the circuit that is moving. And you see the needle again indicating that I'm inducing a current. So this is what we call motional EMF. Obviously, Faraday's law does not care uh, whether you are changing the magnetic flux uh, by moving the circuit or by changing the magnetic field. It uh, has, in both cases, the same effect. So the most classical example The most classical example for motional EMF in Faraday's law is the moving rod, uh, where there is a circuit like this. Let's say we have a resistor R, and then we have a rod that somehow is moving Let's say this is the x direction, this is the y direction, and uh, the height is h. And the rod is moving with a constant velocity v naught x hat. All this inside the magnetic field that is constant, just like in my demonstration in the z direction. So b is b naught in the z direction constant. Now as you see, the, um, this circuit is intercepting time varying flux because this rod is moving, not because the magnetic field uh, changes. We can find out how much is the electromotive force there by applying Faraday's law along the circuit. So you see this is not about the electric field. If I find an electromotive force on a circuit, then I don't care to understand how the electric field lines point. I have the circuit there and I apply Faraday's law on the circuit. That's why this question that we pose today, where is the electric field, had not come up in things like the transformer or uh, the uh, two resistor circuit that I uh, solved on Monday. So here I can apply Faraday's law along uh, a contour like this. Or maybe I can do So this is the moving rod. And I apply Faraday's law in a contour like this. So I'm moving along the circuit. And let's say I will do that counterclockwise, uh, counterclockwise, like this. Okay, so this is my DL. And my DS will be pointing outwards. So points in the direction of the magnetic flux. The length here is x of t. The height is h. The height is h. And therefore, the magnetic flux through this circuit, b dot ds, is equal to magnetic flux density is b naught z hat. Uh, the area vector is dx dy. Z dot z is equal to 1. Indeed, I have considered uh, the, the flux comes out consistently with uh, ds. 
z dot uh, z is equal to 1. So I have b naught integral over the area. Well, the area is x of t times h. Times h. So then I have d phi over dt, which is b naught times h dx over dt. dx over dt is the velocity, the constant velocity. So I have b naught v naught times h. And as a result, I have an electromotive force that acts, I repeat, as a virtual source that if it was positive, it would drive a current in the direction that I'm tracing the loop. So my EMF is like this. It acts as a virtual source. So EMF then is minus B naught V naught H by Faraday's law. So in fact, the minus sign tells me that the actual current goes in the other direction. So you see, I don't worry about the, uh, where the current flows. And many times uh, textbooks will actually tell you, guess where the current flows so that you figure out the polarity. And I don't think that this is necessary. It's easier to simply apply the law. Put in the virtual source and then trust that the final result will tell you where the current flows. And indeed, you see that the current will flow in the other direction. So the actual induced current on this loop will be in the opposite direction. So it will be like this. Okay. And you see now, again, Lenz's law. Here, the way that we have set up the problem, the flux never comes down, always goes up through the circuit. So it's not like the previous example where the flux was increasing, decreasing, increasing, decreasing, and so on. It always increases. So as the rod moves to the right, it always intercepts more and more flux. And therefore, the induced current will work to oppose that external flux. So the current, the induced current, this current we just found, the current I will be uh, VEMF divided by R, so it will be minus uh, B naught, V naught H by R. The minus sign means that the current will not flow this way, it will be flowing the other way. That's what the minus means. And therefore, it will itself produce its own magnetic field that will be opposing the external magnetic field. So now it does oppose the external magnetic field because the flux always increases. So increases monotonically with time and then induce current produces a flux density that opposes the external. So this always works. You simply calculate the magnetic flux and then you take d phi by dt. And this method would actually work very well even if the magnetic field was uh, time varying. We'll see that ca this case uh, on uh, Monday. So I'll stop here. Thanks for your attention and uh, we'll continue next time.